Welcome to Jewish Boy Calls His Mother. I'm your host, Sadia, and this is Jewish Boy Calls His Mother with my mother, Ima. Hey, Ima. Hey, how are you, my sweetness? Good, thank God. All right, so we're going to jump right into it. We're going to talk about if we've ever had the bad dates, and we're also going to talk about school social faux pas. Uh, we're going to jump around a little bit, and we're going to take it from there. So, Ima, what kind of terrible dates did you go on to when you were growing up? <laughs> Well, actually, when you're talking about like, when you're talking about bum dates, I think the most hysterical thing I enjoy reading is at the Shabbos table, the dating navigator. Oh, I love reading Everyone those. Everyone gets such a kick out of that. I sit there oh, reading, yeah. laugh and laugh because some of that stuff, it's like, oh my God, you know, some of that stuff is like, where are your, where are your brains? <laughs> I typed in like, I went out with a guy the other day and all he did was criticize me. Well, Dump them. You know? Well, it's I, some of the, some of the readers though is actually pretty interesting. Where it talks about how, like, for instance, this one girl was was really close to her cousin, but now that they're starting to go on shidduch dates, which is uh, more of like organized dating for marriage, um, they're no longer talking about you know they're no longer talking to each other, and they're no and they're not allowed to talk about uh, their dates, which I think is a good idea. But she was com- but she was complaining that it was a bad idea. Because she misses talking to her her cousin, but I think it's like because what if you well, would date is this a male person? cousin or a female cousin? Female cousin, two female cousins. Oh, two fem- oh, okay, that that clarifies it more. Yeah. Yeah, because I think uh-huh. that in itself, that really like, because if you don't, if what if you guys date the date the same person, and <laughs> you wind up, you went ahead and you you talk, you know, smack about them previously, and then now your cousin's you know dating them, but like. If you think about it, it's just a personal preference. You know, might, they might be good for each other, but it's best not to talk about it. So like, that's something where like, I feel like is just, it makes more sense. But back to the topic, we were talking about uh, bad dates. Now, Emma, you had a bad date you, you mentioned previously? I've had a few of them. What, there was one date I went on. This is a first date. Okay, usually first date, you want to be on your best behavior, right? Yeah. And so it's a shidduch date. And um, so the topic came up, this young man had gone to you know, yeshiva, and now he had left yeshiva, he was a Baal Tshuva. he had gone to one of the Baal Tshuva yeshivas, and he had left it, and um, I don't know what he was doing, so I, the, uh, the topic usually comes up, it's usually a standardized, a standard question where you say, well, why did you leave, you know, yeshiva, or why, you know, what, what are you doing now, or why did you leave yeshiva, and usually most of the answers I would get in the past from other guys would be, well, um, i learned as much as I wanted to, and I felt that uh, it was time to move on, that I wanted to um, get a career underway so that I could get married and support a family. That, those were standard answers I usually get from these decent guys. This guy, when I asked him, gave me this look like with daggers in his eyes and said, what kind of question is that? It was time to leave. You know, really yelled at me. I, I mean, I, hey, I, hey, mister, I just met you. We just got introduced. I, don't you want to don't you want to give a, a nice impression? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really don't get it why people would get like, get mean or angry or defensive when you're dating. It's supposed to be more like laid back. You're not supposed to, I don't know, take things. I mean, you're supposed to take things seriously, but not like too seriously. Um, you know, I've never, I, I had this one, one date I went on where like this, this girl, I thought that like we... I, I thought she understood the shidduch dating world. And I asked her, like, off the bat, typical, sh- typical shidduch question when you're in the religious world, um, how many kids do you plan on having? Like, it's a very, <laughs> it's a very, common, it's a very common question, though. It's a very common question of, like, well, how many kids? Because it's like, we're trying to figure this out. We're trying to work mm-hmm. this out between us about, like, do we have the same values? Do we have the same outlook? Do we have the same goals? Mm-hmm. And she got totally offended and got really upset about it. And I was just kind of weirded out because I'm like, this isn't, this, this doesn't make any sense. Um, but most, most dates I went on were pretty normal. They didn't really have any uh, faux pas or any, any issues. Um, that's why, that's why we're, 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 we're going to be bouncing back and forth between. Well, I had, well, you know, there's one story that um, uh, one of your siblings told me about a friend of theirs who they had arranged a, sh- a shidduch date with um, this friend of theirs. And the guy called, when the girl was sitting and waiting for him, all dressed up, you know, and waiting for him, he called 15 minutes before he was supposed to pick her up and canceled. What was the reason? 
He didn't give it. He just something came up. Oh wow! And that's something. That's. I was I, like, boy, that is bad. Man. You got to have a good reason to cancel was, a date. You really do. I mean, fifteen minutes before, you know. I mean, I could have seen it maybe a couple of days before. Hey, my my work schedule changed. Uh, the boss needs me to come in. Can we rearrange? But the fifteen minutes before. Well, then there, well, there was well, there was one bum date I went on, where. And this is really sad. This guy was a really good catch. Nice looking guy, good career. And um, late, he was in his late 20s. Um, and we were sitting on the porch of um, the host, you know, and uh, just, you know, talking, getting to know each other a little bit. When all of a sudden he, um, this is before the age of cell phones. And the, um, the host comes out on the porch and said and said to this guy hey you know uh your mother says she needs to talk to you so it's very important he goes okay so he jumps out of his seat runs into the house to get the phone comes back out and says i'm sorry i got to get home right away and just jumps in his car and goes off so the next time we went out i said to him uh did your mother know that you were out on a date he says yes she knew and i said well, do you think what she did to you was fair? And he turned on me and yelled at me and said, my mother was a Holocaust survivor. My mother was an Auschwitz. Do you know what that was like? He says, my mother occasionally has these panic times where I, she needs me and I need to be there for her. So I said to him, look, I said, I'm very sorry about what happened to your mother, but for her to interfere in your life like this and ruin your chances of getting married and having a family is exactly what the Nazis would have wanted. Well, he didn't take that, and that <clears throat> ended the evening. Oh, God. Yeah, that, that, that would be a pretty rough day. But I think it's like, it's like someone had definitely has situations where they haven't taken care of certain stuff in order for them to really be on a decent date. I mean... Like, didn't you have like a, you, weren't you really like tired of people asking you like, what were you before you were a Balchuba and you told somebody that you were a stripper? <laughs> yeah, I, I got so tired of guys asking me what I did before I became from that I decided the next guy that asked me that, I'm going to tell him I was a stripper on the block in Baltimore. <laughs> so I did that. He stops the car, he pulls it to the side and he turns on the light. And he gives me a, looks at my face, gives me a very hard look. He goes, no, you weren't. I said, how can you tell? He says, because I, before I became from, I was a bouncer <laughs> in a strip joint. And I can tell you don't have that hardened look. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is pretty funny. I love that story. I, I really, really do. Oh, my gosh. But, um. On to the, the, second, the second topic, it was the, the school social faux pas. Now, I know in my experience um, with bar mitzvahs that yeah, they're expensive. So it's very hard to have this thing where you have to like buy, where you have to set up the whole bar mitzvah for the entire school, the entire grade, or, or the whole bar mitzvah is usually for the entire class um, or just for your friends. And at that point, you kind of like, I don't know, it's in seventh grade, you might get offended here and there, but not, not so much. But the other thing is, is that you had to go ahead and buy gifts for everyone. And they changed it up to being that everybody in the, in, in the grade, everyone chips in, I think $10. And then there's like a grade gift that each kid gets um, because of all the money that's, that's been pulled for everyone else. Mm -hmm. But what, you would, what did you what did you think of that idea? Did you think it was a good idea? I mean, I understand it now. I thought it was stupid back then. I really liked individualism and stuff in the sense where it's like you have a bar mitzvah, you know, and then you have the bar mitzvah party, and then everybody gives you gifts because if you if you just break it down to like twenty five people only give you one gift altogether, that's a certain amount of gifts or checks or money that like won't come to you. You know, it's like, yeah, just, I was point. looking at like statistically wise, I'm like, I'm like, that's my investment money. I, I can't, I can't, you know, <laughs> for like afford to lose all that. So I didn't well, like it. Well, what I like was, well, when in your day, and your school, by the way, really, I have to give, I have to give to Musical Academy a lot of credit. 
they are the type of school that they do learn from their mistakes and they do, and they do correct them. Um, in your day, there was no real coordination because remember, I feel badly about your bar mitzvah that there was another bar mitzvah right around the same time as yours. And so a lot of the kids came and had just come and wish you mazel tov and go right out to the other bar mitzvah. Yeah, that was, um, that, and that I was actually. Good. Now what they do is um, after, then after you, after your year, they really learned from that. And they um, told the parents at the beginning of the year, they wanted to have everybody um, uh, 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 sign up, uh, go into the office, not going to, but you know, um, tell the office, tell the office what day every bar mitzvah is going to be. And they want to coordinate the bar mitzvahs because if there's any two on the same day, they want to approach the parents about rescheduling a bar mitzvah party for another day so that you have no two that are on the same day, which yeah. I thought was a very good idea. But they didn't do that in, when you were there. But I think, they, I think there might have been so many situations similar to yours that that's what they, that's what they decided to do. Well, what happened was, was it was actually really bad. Um, my, my bar mitzvah day, it wasn't just one other bar mitzvah. I think it was four other bar mitzvahs. And I was there and I was getting, about to give my bar mitzvah speech and I was getting so excited because I could give my bar mitzvah speech with tons of people there and everyone's going to be looking and I'm, I just had my ego rise up to like, ah, it's going to be fantastic. And I get up and I start giving my speech and like all my friends left and yeah. they had to leave because they, they were going to the next bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And for me, I couldn't even stay to the end of my bar mitzvah because I was going to another bar mitzvah afterwards. And it was just very, it it, it sounds silly to complain about because it's like, what even was it matter? Who cares? It's just a permissive thing. Get over yourself. Well, but um, yeah, so it, it, when at that, we like you told so social sensitivity, it does, it, it does. Um, it, it's very upsetting to a child. It is. And, and this, I mean, your bar mitzvah day, how many bar mitzvahs are you going to have? You know what I mean? It's like, uh, the, you know, this is a very special day. It's only going to be a one-time shot. And of course you want it to be really you know, memorable in a positive way. Well, I told you the story of what happened to my father's bar mitzvah. Oh, tell how me, disastrous tell me. that was. That yeah. was sad. Yeah, I'll tell it to the audience. Um, my father was born in 1918, and his bar mitzvah was had to be. I guess it was like 1932, 30. It was yeah, about. I guess, I guess it would be like 1930, 1932, height of the depression. And so when what they the way they had bar mitzvahs um, was you had of course you know the shul. And then very few, no shuls really had social halls in those days or big social halls. So it, the Jewish community would use the social hall that was, I think, in one of the um, local hospitals had a social hall. So use the you know, Jewish community would use the social hall there. He says, first of all, his father, his father was like, um, well, my, 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 my grandfather, my father's father changed as he got older. He did become more religious because I remember seeing him going to shul and getting aliyahs. But at that time, I think he was kind of like a little anti-religious, you know, and um, he had to keep the store. I guess he was worried he had to keep the store opened he, uh, because, um, uh, you know, it was the depression, you know, uh, closing your store and not having money. There was no social services available. Uh, you didn't make the buck. You starved serious star starvation so he kept the store open so it was my um it was his grandfather it was my uh it was his father's father who took care of his bar mitzvah and was there for him and took care of all the arrangements so my father gets called up to read his mofter and in those days you had you had a lot of uh jewish men who were not americanized who were not americans at all and who were raised in yeshivas and had no, I don't know, like you said, sensitivity. I had no sensitivity for, say, an American kid. So my father would start to read his mofter, and the guys didn't like, uh, the men that were, that were around him didn't like the pace. They felt it was too slow. So they were nudging him to speed up. So my father tried to read it faster and had to stop and catch a breath. And when he stopped to catch the breath, the men thought that he didn't know it and started to read it on without him. Then yeah. at the end of the whole thing, it was time for him to close the iron hakodesh to pull the curtain. I mean, I felt so badly for my father. I said that this was his honor. This was his day. And the man hands my father two cords and talks to him in Yiddish. My father 
didn't know that much Yiddish, very little. He's an American kid. So he took one of the cords and he pulled it. And instead of closing the curtain, it opened it up even more. So then he pulled the other, the other cord. And again, it opened it up even more. It was probably, probably one of these like tricky things where you probably had to take both cords and like coordinate them or something. So the man who was the, um, the gabai just lost his temper with my father, grabs the cords out of his hands and shuts the iron kodesh himself. And I just saw, I, th I keep thinking about that guy who did that to my father. And I thought that I cannot imagine good karma, any type of good karma coming down for that guy after taking the way, after embarrassing a bar mitzvah boy in public, taking away his honor. And it's something that should have been, you know, and that should have honored him and just taking that away from him. Then uh, when they went for the reception uh, at the social hall in this hospital, the nurse, the head nurse, who my, I had my suspicions that she probably was anti-Semitic, came into the social hall and started to yell at my great-grandfather about people leaving crumbs all over the place. And my great-grandfather was yelling back at her, and people got embarrassed and left the hall. Wow. I, see, I always think that with bar mitzvahs, each bar mitzvah kid, like, goes through goes through the challenge of becoming a man. Cause it's like the, the, it's so, I spoke to other people about their bar mitzvahs and nobody really seems to have a, had a good bar mitzvah story in the sense where they would, they actually enjoyed it. There's always a problem. Um, and, but I think it's kind of funny where it's like, it's like you kind of have to do something where it's not, you're, you're no longer a kid anymore. The, the, the kid part kind of doesn't exist. You know, with me, it was more of like, I had to accept the fact that my, my friends aren't always going to be there when I have something to say. Um, but I know, uh, Yehuda, my older brother, he, he had to shovel the snow, um, <laughs> on his bar mitzvah when it was like, when it was just a complete downpour and that's what he had to do. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the thing where it's like, like it might've been your, your it might've been your, your festivity, but you have a job to do. And I think that's, it's kind of funny where it's like bar mitzvahs kind of have that situation where it's like, it's part of growing up um and accepting life for what it is and that's just something i was always kind of wondered and noticed when it comes to uh bar mitzvah stories so if anybody is a listener who's had a bar mitzvah <laughs> terrible bar mitzvah story please tell me i'd be very curious to know it's a pity this um, isn't a talk show forum you know i'm sure they, i'm sure the folks would be ringing off the hook with people with their individual stories but the miracle about yehuda's bar mitzvah your older brother was that that day there was a snowstorm and we didn't know what to do we were really concerned. I mean, we couldn't really cancel. The hall was rented. Um, the cater, you know, every, we had already hired the, um, the, you know, the caterer, the person. We, we, could, we just couldn't cancel. So we decided to continue. And it was like just, and so Yehuda, you're right, Yehuda went out there with some friend, your father and some of his friends. And they um, totally had to, with ice, uh, with, uh, uh, with salt and with shovels and, uh, you know, break up the ice in the parking lot. Would you believe an hour before the bar mitzvah, the sun came out, the temperature shot all the way up to something like about the high 50s, low 60s, and it all melted. Oh, wow. It was, it was a nace. It was unbelievable. Yeah. That's awesome. But what were you telling me uh, beforehand about um, this other social foot pause when you're talking about you had Valentine's Day when you were in school. Oh, that was disastrous. Yeah. Um, Valentine's Day. I don't know. I, I, I don't know why the teachers did this. I don't know what it years ago in the 50s and before the 50s, for some reason, when it came to, like you said, social sensitivities, uh, the teachers and the parents just weren't there. I don't know what it was. But we used, I went to, like I said, you know, the public school. And about a few weeks before Valentine's Day, uh, for an art project, the teachers would pass out uh, paper bags, and you could cut and paste and color and decorate them, put your name on them. And then at the base of the blackboard, the base of the blackboard was always wooden. So they would take thumbtacks, and they would thumbtack each paper bag up to the, you know, in front of the blackboard. So as the weeks went on, you could see very clear, you would, the purpose of the bags was to put Valentines in the bags, you know, for the kids in the class, each, you know, to exchange Valentines. Each kids would, you know, my parents 
many of the parents would buy their kids these uh, booklets where there were these pretty valentines and you would cut them out and put them in the envelopes that came with the, with the booklet. And then you would put the child's name on it that you wanted to give it to and you would put it in their bag. Well, as the weeks went on, you could very, very clearly see who the popular kids were and who the social outcasts were because the popular kids by Valentine's Day, their bags would be totally bulging. And the kids who weren't so popular, they would have like just a, like I said, one or two or fewer Valentines. And oh. to me, that was, you know, ah, uh, come on, you know, you didn't have to, that's, that's almost like public embarrassment. Yeah, probably something was. Something like that. <laughs> and I told you about that boy. Oh, you know, uh, first, yeah, in second grade. Oh, yeah, when you gave him that giant yeah, there was a uh, Valentine's Day. Yeah, I had a crush on him, so I gave him this real nice, big, beautiful Valentine. And he ran with it, ripped it up, spat on it, and threw it away. I mean, I think to myself, where was the teacher? I, don't I mean, think the should, teacher cared. I mean, I, yeah, the teacher really should have been watching, should have been more observant, and seeing something like that, should have come over, grabbed the boy, and said, hey, you don't do this to somebody and she's really had she had like i said any social sense she should have brought him over and forced him to apologize uh, i don't get it it's just, it's get just it ridiculous i don't see why valentine's day for kids is so good because it just messes them up even worse than valentine's day for adults it's just a terrible <laughs> holiday i really believe so i don't i don't know what they're doing now in the public schools i don't i don't know if they do that anymore i hope they don't yeah all right. Well, we're out of time, but thank you everybody for listening. And thank you, Emo, for joining, uh, joining me in this wonderful podcast. Okay. You have a good job. Love you. All right. Love you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Hi, thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe and share. I really appreciate it. And my mother does as well.